welcome. Uh, thank you for uh, attending. And I know it's mandatory. Okay, but we'll pretend it's not mandatory and everyone came out on this cold night. Um, this will be uh, our first, um, first year of our DPT3 Grand Rounds presentation. First one will be Katie Ferrara, and uh, she's starting it off with the, ball, with the great thing. Katie, congratulations on the first one. Good luck. Thanks. <laughs> Okay, so uh, my case presentation is on Bonnie. And this is a patient that I saw on my acute care internship in, my, in the first summer internship. Uh, and this was in a hospital in Denver, Colorado. She is a 57-year-old female. Uh, prior to her recent diagnosis, she lived alone and performed all of her activities independently. And she was also gainfully employed. Um, her family is very supportive. She has five children and I'm not positive if all of the children live there, but most of the five daughters live there. Uh, her past medical history is pretty much uh, not, not significant, except for a history of adjustment disorder with depressed mood, which may come into play uh, during her interventions, and that's just something to keep in mind in the back of your head. Um, in January 2007, she presented with progressive right upper extremity weakness num and numbness, and this spread in a clockwise fashion to her bilateral lower extremities and her left upper extremity. The diagnosis that was given was an ex extensive cervical medullary to thoracic intramedullary spinal cord tumor, uh, which can also be called an ependymoma. An ependymoma accounts for two to six percent of the uh, central nervous system tumors, and they're the most common neoplasm among the intermedullary spinal cord tumors. They're usually benign and also curable with, surger, uh, with surgical resection or in combination with radiotherapy. Some evidence-based practice uh, that I looked up, one uh, article stated that they looked at patients treated between 85 and uh, 2001, and then they analyzed the data in 2004. And among the 20 patients that they analyzed, 19 were still alive in 2004, and 13 that had complete resection survived, and there was no surgically related deterioration in their neurological functions. Two other articles. Yeah. Do you want me to go back to that slide? What? Oh, yeah. And is this specifically for MRI? Or is this it is not. It is just one from the internet that was um, on an ependymoma. And we're looking at what? With this? The arrows will show that it's like a, a space occupying lesion around the spinal cord. Yep. I don't have a laser pointer, otherwise I would put it, but the arrows are there. <laughs> yeah, and I encourage any questions throughout. Thank you for doing that. <laughs> Okay, so two other articles. Um, Kane et al. did a long-term follow-up of 40 patients that they saw after um, surgical removal, and it, they showed that 90% were still independently mobile when they did their long-term follow-up. And then Iwasaki et al. looked at 29 patients followed over four years, and 27 of the 29 had neurological symptoms that were stabilized or improved. So this shows that there's a pretty good survival rate and um, you know, their lifestyle isn't necessarily completely changed if they can surgically remove the whole tumor. So Bonnie's timeline, um, just to give you an idea of uh, how this happened. In January, she presented, and that's when they diagnosed her with the ependymoma. Uh, January 22nd is when she had her first surgery, and then April 20th is when she had her second surgery. And um, just a little side note, that uh, prior to the admittance in April, she had been living with her, one of her daughters and was independent in gait with some ataxia, and this is without using an assistive device. Um, so now I'm gonna go into the surgery details. The first surgery that was on January 22nd was a posterior cervical laminectomy, C3 to C6, and then they also did exploration of the tumor um, and some excision of the tumor as well as aspiration and drainage. And they do the exploratory surgery to be able to explore the staging of the tumor, as well as uh, see the extent of its invasion into the spinal cord. The second surgery, which is the one that I saw her after, um, 
was in April uh, was on April 20th and this one was a little bit more extensive than the first but a similar surgery they did a craniectomy lam laminectomy um, so went all the way up uh, towards the brain so they took out part of the form and magnum um, C1 C2 excision and then they took out the tumor and this is also with a posterior occipital uh, cervical instrumentation and fusion from the occiput all the way down to C6. So it's a multi-level fusion. Um, a little explanation of what a laminectomy and a fusion are. Cervical laminectomy is, can be a pro, uh, performed from a posterior approach, and they take out the lamina, the posterior longitudinal ligament, and any bone spurs um, that are there. There can be two, two types of laminectomies. One is the complete removal of the lamina, um, but this could potentially cause loosening of the facet joints, and that's pretty much why she had the fusion along with it, because it was multi-level. Um, you can also have the option of a hinge, which is only a partial cut through one lamina, and then a complete cut through the other, when it kind of just forms a hinge. Um, and this can allow for opening just on one side. Bonnie's was actually a complete removal. Um, so she also had a cervical fusion, and the fusion can also be known as an arthrodesis, and this is the joining of two or more vertebrae into a solid bone formation. You can do an anterior approach or a posterior approach. Hers was a posterior approach. Um, and the goal is to decrease the instability and to protect the spinal cord. So with a posterior approach, a layer of bone is shaved from the, bo uh, from the vertebrae to cause the surface to bleed and promote bony healing. And then they also use bone grafts, which are usually take from the iliac crest because that is an exposed area of bone that doesn't have muscular attachment. Um, and they put those strips where they um, scrape the surface where it was bleeding. Um, and this helps promote a fusion of, with your bones. And then you can also use instrumentation with metal plates, screws, and rods, which will also help with the stability. In an anterior approach, the disc is removed between the vertebral bodies and a bone graft or instrumentation is put in place. And you can use static or dynamic plates and the dynamic plates allow for slight rotation. Um, for future reference, if you guys are interested, the, the link that is there will, sh will take you through a little um, tutorial of a posterior fusion. Um, there is an internet, so I am not able to do that right now. Um, but if you guys are interested, it'll take you through a little tutorial about it. Um, some additional complications, not only did she have this surgery, but there were many other factors on top of it that uh, we had to think about when we, before we even walked into the room. So all of this must be kept in mind um, when we were treating her. And we also needed to educate Bonnie throughout the process and then as well as through her progression. So I'm going to go into some of those um, other complications that um, came about. So she was on mechanical ventilation, and a little bit about mechanical ventilation, it's a positive pressure to inflate the lungs, and some things that can be used for uh, if a person has decreased respiratory rate. Partial pressure of O2 is less than 50 uh, millimeters of mercury with supplemental oxygen or respiratory failure, and hers was because of respiratory failure. As you know, the phrenic nerve is invaded by C3, C4, C5, and since her surgery was way up there, the spinal shock may have caused some respiratory failure there. Um, there's two types of mechanical ventilation, volume, ventilators, volume ventilators and pressure, pressure ventilators, sorry. Um, and there's many modes of ventilation, and I listed them um, in order of the most amount of assistance from the ventilator to least amount of assistance. Um, Bonnie also had a tracheostomy, and these are usually used when ventilatory support is required for a prolonged period of time. And this could be because of an increased risk of infection if you have it um, down the throat for a long period of time. The tube is inserted directly into the anterior trachea below the vocal cords, and it can also allow um, more mobilization of the patient um, if they are mechanically vented. It's a longer tube, and it's a more stable location than if it's down the throat. Um, so weaning from mechanical ventilation. The intent is to decrease the level of support provided by the ventilator as well as to increase the workload by the patient. So this is um, after they're out of their um, very acute stage uh, of respiratory failure and they're starting to come back around. You want to start weaning them off because you don't want them to become dependent on 
a mechanical ventilator. Um, so you can do this in two ways, uh, which is the modification of the ventilatory settings or the progression of time spent with less ventilatory support. Uh, and we definitely had to time our treatment sessions around her weaning schedule because the, uh, if a patient has been on mechanical ventilation for a while um, and they're going through a weaning process, they'll get very tired and fatigued after they've gone through a, a treatment of trying to wean them. So we wanted to see them before um, they would do a weaning um, time period. Some medications that she was on, there's <laughs> quite a long list here, and I, definitely, I just wanted to highlight some of the uh, side effects that happen because a lot of them are very similar. A lot of them had to do with dizziness um, and peripheral edema, which is going to come into play when we're treating. Um, and because many of them cause dizziness, this was definitely amplified. So um, she was on albuterol, which was to prevent and relieve bronchospasm. Um, and one of the reactions was dizziness. She was on Celebrex, which is an NSAID to help with pain. Um, and this also has a side effect of dizziness as well as peripheral edema. Lovenox is for preventing uh, PEs and DVTs, and this is helpful for her. She was in the ICU the whole time I saw her, so she's definitely not doing a lot of moving around. So we want to prevent that. She was on Procrit for anemia, um, and one of the side effects is edema. Diflucan, which is for oropharyngeal or esophopharyngeal candidiasis. I'm <laughs> sorry, I can't say that word. Um, <laughs> And uh, another side effect, again, is dizziness. Um, Fluoronef, um, this is for when excessive amounts of sodium are lost in the urine. And she had a lot of uh, hormonal changes going on while she was you know, there, because she's in this acute stage. So um, a lot of sodium was being lost in her urine. Um, she's also on Prevacid. <laughs> And this is associated for gastric ulcers associated with NSAIDs. Since she was already on an NSAID, I assume that this was to counteract that and try and prevent gastric ulcers. Um, she was also on Midorin HCL, which is for symptomatic orthostatic hypotension, and this is definitely a problem that she had, and I will talk about that um, in a little bit. Uh, and she was also on Metroniz... <laughs> Dizoli, which is for um, diarrhea and colitis associated with um, C. diff. Just a few more. She's on Seroquel for psychosis, uh, Coumadin for, to also help prevent venous thrombosis, PEs, or atrial fibrillation, and then she was on a drug for hypertension. And the last two, lorazepam for anxiety, um, and this is a big issue for her. Um, she, because she was on a trach, she wasn't able to communicate with us, and so she had quite a bit of anxiety when we would do some of our interventions, and so they used this drug to try and help with that. And then she was also on some morphine for severe pain after her uh, surgery. Orthostatic hypertension is also called postural hypotension. The definition of it is systolic blood pressure that decreases um, of at least 20 millimeters of mercury, or a diastolic blood pressure that decreases at least 10 millimeters of mercury within three minutes of standing up. And I take this standing up as it can be from supine to sit or sit to stand. It's basically a postural change, hence the, um, the reason you can also call it postural hypotension. Um, the American Autonomic Society, as well as the American Academy of Neuro Neurology, have definitions for tilt table um, interventions as well, because this is going to be different than a postural change of sit to stand or supine to sit. Um, another definition that I found is that, or another reason I should say, is that the blood pools in the lower extremities and the body's natural process of counteracting the low blood pressure is interrupted. And so that's why you get this decrease in blood pressure. Some causes of orthostatic hypotension can be dehydration, medication, heart problems, and nervous system disorders. And if we think back to what she had, she probably had um, three of these, being dehydration, um, some of her medications causing this, as well as a nervous system disorder. Some risk factors can be age, medications, certain diseases, heat exposure, bed rest, crossing your legs, and she obviously didn't have any of these. Hers was more um, surgery driven, but just as a side note. Some treatment can be lifestyle changes, compression stockings, or medications. 
and she um, did have obviously one medication and they were also using compression stockings with her. Some other uh, non-pharmacologic treatments that you can use for orthostatic hypertension is doing ankle pumps before you stand up, um, making slow careful changes in position, eating small frequent meals, increasing the salt and fluid intake, elevating the head of the bed um, 5 to 20 degrees before getting up, um, and scheduling activities in the afternoon after you've had more blood flow and you're more alert, and wearing compression stockings again. Okay, so for Bonnie, she had a few systems involved. Orthopedically, she had cervical precautions that we had to think of before we walked in there with her surgery. She had neurological problems. She had paralysis of her extremities. She basically had spinal shock. And she also had cardiovascular and pulmonary uh, problems with her respiratory failure and using the vent. So our examination, we evaluated her on April 24th and some of the findings that we found um, through this examination. She wasn't arousable except for brief periods of opening her eyes. Um, her passive range of motion was within, func within functional limits except for on bilateral ankle dorsiflexion was limited to only neutral. Her family reported that she was able to control her left upper extremity when she was awake, but she has difficulty controlling her right lower extremity is unable to move her right upper extremity. So from this, our assessment is that she was status post uh, spinal surgery and presents very fatigued, so only passive range of motion could be assessed. <laughs> assessed. She would benefit from PT services to further assess her active range of motion and to improve passive range of motion. Uh, we wanted to see her for one to two times a day, five to six days a week. And we wanted to be able to further assess her active range of motion to see what she could actually do. The practice pattern that I picked for her was um, 5H, which was part of the neurological, and it's um, impaired motor function, peripheral nerve integrity, and sensory integrity associated with non-progressive disorders of the spinal cord. And I picked this one because it uh, most encompassed uh, all of the systems that were involved in her case. Um, the goals that were set from our examination in the hospital that, that I was at and in a lot of acute care you're seeing these patients for such a short time that it's hard to make long-term goals because it's gonna, you're gonna see them for a week. We, had, we did end up seeing her for a longer time, but when we originally wrote the goals, we had our short-term goals and long-term goals the same. Um, so we only had two goals because we wanted to further assess her, but they were to promote one to five degrees of uh, bilateral ankle dorsiflexion, passive range of motion, and as well as to be able to assess the active range of motion and set further goals. So um, I'm just gonna go through a few of the interventions to show her progression and show some of the things that we did along the way until she was discharged. Um, Bonnie, it's important to note that Bonnie was re-intubated for mechanical ventilation the day after we did our evaluation. So this um, added that extra uh, element to our examination the next time we saw her. So on the 25th, we assessed her active range of motion and her right upper extremities sorry, right upper extremity was without active range of motion except for trace external rotation. Um, and her strength was grossly two to two minus out of five in her left upper extremity and lower extremity, and there was no active range of motion in her left lower extremity. Um, we changed the second goal to be able, for her to be able to perform five to 10 reps of consistent active range of motion in her left upper extremity and lower extremity. Um, in the second week that we saw her, we were able to get her up um, to sitting on the edge of bed, and she, this was a dependent lift times two to get her out to the edge of bed, and she sat there, she was able to maintain this for eight minutes with our help. So uh, we changed another goal that day to perform 20 reps of, with a red TheraBand resistive exercise in the left or lower extremity, because she was able to withstand more resistance by then. Um, during week three, there was a new order for PT to work on tilt table and therapeutic exercise. This was not something that we had before. Um, the picture shows a tilt table and we use something very similar to this. Um, and we also changed, uh, after we did this intervention that day, she was able to tolerate 40 degrees um, of tilt on the tilt table for 15 minutes. So we uh, established a, another goal for her to be able to tolerate 20 degrees of tilt for 15 minutes 
um, because at 40 degrees, her orthostatic hypertension uh, kicked in and she wasn't able to tolerate as well as we wanted her to. Um, on the 25th, 21st of May, which was into her fourth week with us, um, there was a new order to use Job's compression pumps on her lower extremities while on the tilt table, which was to help increase their circulation and hopefully prevent more orthostatic hypotension. In her fifth week with us, uh, we reassessed her lower extremity strength and she was showing uh, three minus out of five hip flexion, four out of five hip extension, um, three plus out of five in her left knee extension, this is all on the left side, and then um, three plus, plus out of five in left ankle dorsiflexion. So she had gained a little bit of strength since our initial evaluation. Um, and then another order that was added was the tilt table was to be without the jokes pumps, and, but only to inflate them if the her systolic blood pressure um, decreased to 90 uh, uh, millimeters of mercury. And uh, just so that it was less cumbersome, we still put on the Joe's pumps before we transferred her over to the tilt table, but then we only inflated them if her uh, blood pressure went below 90. Um, we uh, progressed one of her goals to tolerate 50 degrees of tilt on the tilt table um, for 15 minutes. And then into her sixth week, we started alternating the tilt table and cardiac chair. And we, my CI kind of wanted to start doing this so that um, she could, you can, you know, move the knees down. That's a picture of the, a cardiac chair. And you can move the knees down so that it's more like sitting and she's able to do her um, therapeutic exercise while sitting in the chair. And it also helps promote trunk control. On the tilt table, you're strapped in. You're not really, it's kind of a more passive thing. So that, that's just more for tilting. Um, but the cardiac chair, she could be a little bit more of an active participant in this. So we decided in her treatments that we would alternate the tilt table and the cardiac chair. We added another goal to tolerate sitting in the cardiac chair at 80 degrees of tilt with the lower extremities dangling for 15 minutes. Um, an article about the benefits of using a tilt table in the acute care setting, uh, Chang et al. found that when he, he looked at patients intubated and mechanically ventilated for five or more days, and Bonnie definitely was, um, they had passive tilt to 70 degrees for five minutes, and their results showed that mechanical ventilation increased, respiratory rate increased, and there were no adverse effects on the partial pressure of O2 or the partial pressure of CO2. Um, and I believe his findings showed that these um, increased both while, this, while they were on the tilt table as well as prolonged for um, minutes after they uh, were taken off the tilt table as well. So that's a very good um, finding. Her, she was, Bonnie was discharged on uh, June 7th to a local rehab hospital, and it was actually a very good rehab hospital, so we were happy that she got in there. Um, and she was in the hospital with us for 49 days altogether. Our final intervention, she, her left lower extremity showed hip flexion um, strength three minus out of five, extension four out of five, knee flexion three out of five, extension four out of five, ankle plantar flexion and dorsiflexion four out of five, and then in her right lower extremity, she had strength of two out of five, ex uh, extension two plus out of five, knee flexion two out of five, and extension three minus out of five. So this was a definite improvement from our initial evaluation. She couldn't even move her right lower extremity um, against gravity, so that was good. Um, therapeutic exercise that she was able to do on that last intervention, she could uh, do left lower extremity hip and knee flexion ankle plantar flexion and dorsiflexion with a blue TheraBand times 20 reps, um, knee flexion with a yellow TheraBand times 20 reps, and light manual resistance for her hip abduction and adduction uh, for 10 reps. Some of the other providers that were involved in her care, um, nursing was obviously involved a lot here. She was in the ICU the whole time that she was in the hospital, and usually in the ICU, it's a one-to-one -one ratio or a one uh, nurse to two patient ratio. So she definitely had intimate um, care from the, the nurses. There, so they were there for constant surveillance, and they also assisted us with dependent lifts as well as assistance with the intubation tubes. When I first went in there, I didn't have um, the greatest hold on how to maneuver the tubes while we were moving her over onto a tilt table, so the nurse was kind enough to help me, um, as well as observing the vitals while we were helping. Um, occupational 
therapy came in and did interventions as like hand therapy. She could lightly move the hand and she also used a suction to help uh, with her excretions in her mouth. So she was able to, she only had small movements with her hand. Um, so they were trying to help with upper extremity range of motion as well as movement and dexterity to help maintain that. Um, respiratory therapy were involved with her weaning process as well as respiratory uh, therapy interventions. And once again, you know, we had to plan around both occupational therapy and respiratory therapy when we went to do our interventions. Um, a neurosurgeon and a respiratory medicine doctor were there for daily rounds and they reassessed her status and provided new orders when it was necessary. Uh, and the case management was also involved for coordination uh, in transferring to the local rehab hospital. Um, I asked a local therapist, Stacy Cox, she works at Allied Rehab, she works a lot with spinal cord injured patients. I asked her for her opinion on what she thought might happen with this patient after she had left the hospital. I was not able to find out exactly what happened to Bonnie um, after she left us at the hospital. So I asked her opinion, Stacy's opinion. Um, and she said that she should be able to gain full return of her function if the tumor was removed and there, were no, there was no residual uh, core damage. And um, she projected that there would be a four to, week, uh, four to six week length of stay in rehab and then if she needed more therapy, she would have done that on an outpatient basis. Some ethical considerations for Bonnie. Um, one thing that I thought of was I, was, I questioned whether she was DNR before she went into this surgery, knowing that there might be respiratory failure and that she would have to put on a mechanical um, vent, she would have maybe need to have taken off DNR to be able to do that. And also, because she was put on a vent with the trachea, uh, she wasn't able to communicate any of her wants. So it was really important for us as therapists to make sure we're looking at her facial expressions, taking, you know, care of her vitals and making sure that she's involved and that she's okay with all the interventions that we were doing with her. Some age-related issues for her. Um, she's still very young and we wanted to make sure that she could get back to um, returning to work since she had stopped working before her last surgery. Um, we would need for her to regain her cervical range of motion after the surgery to be able to turn her head while she's driving. Um, she had been living with her daughter, so it's a consideration to think about would she need to go back to living with her daughter or can she go back to living on her own again? Um, and lastly, uh, the financial implications of continued rehab. If she needed more outpatient therapy, would insurance cover that? It's something to question and think about later on. Um, also, she had a multi-level fusion and considerations for this that she would most like, she would maybe need another surgery later in life. Multi-level fusions, you know, typically get looser on either end of it. I mean, obviously this one all the way up to the skull, but maybe down in her thoracic region, more movement happens where you, where you have, you know, you have immobilization and then the mobilization part. So the, the part that's taking the more mobilization may need to be fused later on. So that's definitely a consideration because she's still young enough that this may be an implication for her. Some conclusions. It is important to keep all the affected systems in mind during her intervention since she definitely had a lot of uh, systems involved in her care. Um, it was important to keep Bonnie involved in her care and keep her calm during her treatment sessions. And in, in her situation, small gains were very big gains and we needed to uh, reassure her that all of these things were happening for a positive re, uh, reason and that we wanted to make sure there were no secondary complications so that she could really strive once she got into the rehab process. Um, I'd like to let, thank Lou for his help in the background research, <laughs> um, my CI, John Danny, Stacey Cox for expert opinion, and Dr. Weiner and Dr. Weininger for their help along the way. Does anybody have any questions? Yeah, 
I mean, because she didn't come to, this wasn't like she came to outpatient therapy with residual. I think she went to go see her doctor first and was noticing that she had numbness in her arm and it was starting to progress. So that was the only sign that, at least that I could get from her chart and from the information given. I'm not positive, it never really said. She had been intubated during surgery and then she was extubated because um, they thought she must have, they must have thought that she was stable. So something must have happened that she wasn't stable anymore and they needed to reintubate her. And with the stable, um, how do you know that you're going to quit now? You said the blood pressure was drop. So you're uh, monitoring the blood pressure and actually using the stable? Yeah, we had um, luckily in the ICU that I was in, they had a pretty long cord and so we kept the blood pressure cuff on her the whole time and we had it set um, to the screen that it would recheck it every minute or every couple minutes. So we had a constant um, read on her blood pressure the whole time that we were doing it and we just made sure we didn't go too fast. We look at her heart rate, maybe her oxygen. I think she also had, she might have had a I mean arterial pressure line that would also show that. <laughs> Any other questions? <laughs> Thanks guys.